our previous installment, we went over many of Mr. Lofton's pet arguments against the Orthodox Church and provided clips of him speaking in which he presented his objections followed by our responses. In this second video, we will continue responding to even more clips of his on additional topics. Now, it should be noted that in our previous video, as a sign of charity, we had offered Mr. Lofton 200% of our time in a debate if he agreed to debate us on any Orthodox channel. As of yet, Mr. Lofton has not responded to this offer, and so we are expanding this from 200% of our time to a full 300% of our time. Furthermore, we have an open debate challenge to anyone who takes issue with our views. This can be done on an agreed third-party platform, but if they are willing to come onto our channel and debate via live stream, thereby driving traffic to our channel, we will offer them 150% of our time. This offer is open to anyone and everyone by simply contacting us privately or publicly to arrange a time, a topic, a moderator, and a venue. Before we continue, though, we would like to mention our new sponsor, Free Filtering. FreeFiltering.org is a free DNS-based web filtering system designed by a father who wants to make the internet a safer place for souls. Free filtering will help block websites that are devoted to promoting evil. It will help you automatically block roughly 1.8 million pornographic websites already cataloged in our database. They have also built in artificial intelligence that automatically detects if a brand new website is pornographic, so it's blocked before it even loads. If you want to help keep your family safe from predatory internet websites, or if you are a young man who struggles with pornography, help yourself avoid temptations and download free filtering using our referral ID link in the description below. Several days after our video premiere, Mr. Lofton attempted to reply to us in a video entitled, Does Orthodoxy Have a Universally Binding Magisterium? In which, accompanied by a hastily thrown together PowerPoint, and neither naming us nor presenting even one clip of our video, or even so much as a quotation from us, he merely repeated his already redundant talking points. It became painfully clear that Mr. Lofton hadn't actually watched our video, as most of his objections had already been addressed in it, and instead of actually interacting with these counterarguments and responding to them point by point, he simply repeated what he had already mistakenly said. It appeared that Mr. Lofton had composed the entirety of his response based purely on secondhand accounts of our video, which is ironic, considering that in his roughly four-hour-long rant against Ancient Faith Radio, he had accused them and then chastised them for the same thing that he appears to have done here, not actually listening to a video before responding to it. Furthermore, in his attempted response video, which ran for nearly an hour, Mr. Lofton was unable to quote even a single official document from a pan-Orthodox synod or local synod. In fact, the only source Mr. Lofton could quote on anything was an introductory work for laymen by the late Callisto Ware, an assistant bishop who was not writing in any official function, but purely on his own, and thereby had to have his work published by Penguin, a secular publishing company. The late Bishop Ware though beloved among many converts in the English-speaking world, is virtually unknown outside of that milieu, and his works have received nothing like an imprimatur or a nihil obstat, and, to our knowledge, have never been endorsed by a synod. In fact, Mr. Lofton could only provide a couple of partial quotations from him, and that was it. What Mr. Lofton would have required in order to prove his points is official statements of synods and he failed even in that relatively meager standard by citing as his authority an individual who was neither writing in any official capacity nor had an official position as spokesman. As Mr. Lofton's response video is mostly, simply, a repeat of his talking points that we have in a more succinct form in clips from other shows he has done, clips that are contained in our first video and we will cover in this second video, we will limit our interaction to a few clips from his response that bring up newer forms of his argument not covered elsewhere. For example, Mr. Lofton inadvertently undermines Catholic teaching on ecumenical councils when he argues that a teaching given or a confession or creed that is adopted unanimously by the Church is not an example of a teaching authority 
because it is simply doing so based on prior commitment. Here's some other points to consider. Pan-Orthodox synods in Eastern Orthodoxy are not considered binding in and of themselves, but are binding if received by the synod of bishops. Hmm. But we have to ask the question now, received by all synods in Eastern Orthodoxy? For every one of the um, every one of the Orthodox churches, all of their synods have to receive this pan-Orthodox synod before it's binding? If unanimous reception is needed, then it is not the council that is binding, but the synods who receive the teachings of the synod due to some prior commitment. Think about that for a second. Think about it. In this case, it's not actually the council in the synod itself that is binding. It's rather a prior commitment by those synods, and they're just saying, yes, this pan-Orthodox synod agrees with us. So in this case, it's not a universally binding teaching authority. It's rather a prior commitment that is binding. But how is that different than Roman Catholic ecumenical councils? Don't Catholic ecumenical councils make decisions based on prior commitments that are binding, whether those be prior ecumenical councils, prior papal decrees, or prior ex cathedra decrees? Based on Michael's logic, apparently not. This is exceptionally rich and highly entertaining, considering Michael's unabashed support of Vatican II and his personal crusade to prove it is in accord with previous magisterial decisions. If Catholic teaching is not beholden to some prior commitment that is binding, why would it matter if Vatican II accorded with previous magisterial decisions? Now, at least in theory, in Catholic ecumenical councils, documents are brought forth and proposed. They are then scrutinized in light of the decrees of previous ecumenical councils, papal decrees, and the consensus of the Church Fathers. If the bishops consider these new documents to be in accord with those prior decrees, then they vote in favor of the new documents. If they find them to be in contradiction to those prior decrees, then they vote against them. Michael doubles down on this later on in the same video from Minute Marks 1805 to 2006. If all have to receive a council, as I mentioned earlier, it is not the council that is binding, but is another prior commitment and belief that is binding. So reception does not prove that there is a universally binding teaching authority. It just says that, hey, if there's this prior commitment to something in orthodoxy, as long as this council lines up with it, then we receive it. Okay, if that's the case, it's not the council that's binding. But we're asking the question, is there a universally binding teaching authority. A prior commitment is not necessarily a teaching authority. Thus, reception cannot be appealed to as universally binding, as far as the teaching authority. At best, it's a universally binding commitment. <laughs> but what makes one disposed to be bound to it to begin with? And again, what group is saying that this is something that we are bound to? Because there's plenty of other Christians who have apostolic succession that wouldn't be in that group. Such reception would be useless since it would show there wasn't a disagreement that needed to be debated in a council in the first place. That's another point. If you already have this prior commitment to something, and it's upon that basis that you receive a council, the council in and of itself doesn't coerce and demand your assent, it's rather the prior commitment, then this was useless because if there was already a universal consensus on this issue, we didn't need a council to begin with. And yet we have had historically plenty of councils that debated issues. So that doesn't even square with the data. Again, is consensus and a prior commitment to previous binding decrees not two necessary characteristics of how Catholic ecumenical councils work? What about the universal ordinary magisterium? 
Isn't that based on the bishops of the world, in unity with the Pope, decreeing that something is or is not within the deposit of faith, and doing so based on previous magisterial teachings? Even in the case of ex cathedra statements, the Pope is apparently only capable of doing so if those teachings are in accord with previous teachings. When it is put into context like this, one realizes that Michael Lofton is simply so desperate to deny we have a magisterium that he inadvertently denies Catholic teachings to do so. Either that, or he thinks that the job of a council is to come up with novel teachings, something he would surely attempt to deny if confronted with. But Mr. Lofton makes another claim we should analyze. He claims that if there is already a consensus, then there is no need to call a council because councils require debate. It never occurs to Mr. Lofton that in most of the councils, there was a debate, and then a nearly unanimous decision was reached as members of one party were won over to the majority. Such a situation occurred at the Council of Ephesus regarding the condemnation of Nestorius and the approval of the letters of St. Cyril. It also occurred at Chalcedon concerning the Tome of St. Leo, as well as with disciplinary topics such as the deposition of Dioscorus and the restoration of Theodoret and Ebus of Edessa. Now, Mr. Lofton would likely cite the papacy as the impetus behind this, but that would fail to account for the actions of the majority of bishops at the Fifth Ecumenical Council when they suspended Pope Vigilius from office and forced him to bend to the council's decision. Another situation is one in which there can be a heresy that exists almost exclusively among the laity and lower clergy, such as bogomilism and monophysitism, yet is largely absent from the episcopate. Even in the case of Nestorianism, relatively few bishops adhered to it. Proof of this is that almost all those bishops who had rejected the decrees appear to have rejected them based largely on the fact that St. Cyril had appeared to act unilaterally and refused to await the arrival of John of Antioch. Proof of this is that those bishops which had rejected the decrees proceeded to turn around and, with little to no pressure, accepted them two years later in 433 when John of Antioch did. At that point, Nestorius was virtually alone in his opposition to the hypostatic union. As we discussed in our previous video, at least according to the history of the monophysite bishop John of Ephesus, the monophysites were relatively insignificant on an episcopal level and highly fragmented with nearly 20 different groups merely in Egypt. But these movements were wildly popular among the laity and monastics of Syria and Egypt, to the point that Jacob Baradeus had to ordain thousands of bishops, priests, and deacons in order to create a monophysite hierarchy to replace the hierarchy that had sided with Chalcedon. Further, it was only with repeated and persistent imperial intervention that Arianism expanded outside a relatively small group of the hierarchy, and once that imperial intervention stopped under Emperor Theodosius I, Arianism rapidly collapsed and lived out the rest of its short existence primarily among the Goths. In this next clip from Mr. Lofton's response, that he won't name as a response, Minute Mark 1655 to 1759, he doubles down on his straw man argument and then adds in revisionist history in regard to councils. What about reception? I mentioned it earlier, and this is a huge one in Eastern Orthodoxy. This theory says that councils are only binding insofar as they have been received by the Orthodox Church. This begs the question received by whom? Nicaea was not received by all. Constantinople I was not received by all. Even those who accept Constantinople I today in, in Catholicism and Orthodoxy, it wasn't immediately received by all. It was just considered a local synod for a while. Ephesus I was not received by all. Chalcedon was not received by all. We, I mean, we have huge schisms over Chalcedon in Ephesus I. Constantinople II wasn't received by all, and so on. Florence wasn't received by all, now was it? Again, I can ask the same question. Who makes up the councils in relation to reception? You know, so on and so forth. Mr. Lofton states that Nicaea I, Constantinople I, Ephesus, Chalcedon, and Constantinople II were not accepted by all. This is odd, 
because the official letters produced by the First Council of Nicaea state that they had arrived at a unanimous decision, with only a handful of bishops abstaining. This is recorded in Eusebius, Socrates, and Sozomen, and the pertinent quotations from those authors can be seen in our Florilegia entitled, What Makes a Council Ecumenical? Parts 1 and 2. It was in the fallout years later that anti-Nicene bishops were installed by the government and Orthodox ones exiled in parts of the empire. In the case of Constantinople I, it was received by all of the synods by the mid-6th century, with, ironically, Rome being the last to accept it. This last observation is yet another proof that the East was quite capable of coming to common decisions without Rome present to arbitrate between parties. Ephesus had been received by all of the synods within two years of closing, which is what the reunion letter of 433 celebrates. Chalcedon, as we discussed in our previous video, was also received by all the synods relatively quickly, but it is worth going over again. In the discussion prior to the issuance of the deposition, various reasons were discussed as to why Dioscorus must be deposed, such as his acts at Ephesus II the attempt at single-handedly deposing the Pope, corruption, etc. But the most consistent and cited reason among the bishops was his refusal of the triple summons to attend the council, and it was this issue alone that is mentioned by name in the official letter of deposition sent to Dioscorus. It is likely that the bishops present felt that none of the other issues could be as canonically justified as this one, but the official letter of deposition sent to Dioscorus merely states, quote, the holy, great, and ecumenical council, convoked by the grace of God and according to the decree of our most pious and God-beloved emperors in the city of Chalcedon in Bithynia, in the martyrium of the most holy and victorious martyr Euphemia, to Dioscorus. On account of your contempt for the divine canons and your disobedience to this holy and ecumenical council, because, in addition to the other crimes for which you have been convicted, you did not present yourself even when summoned a third time by this holy and great council, according to the divine canons, to answer the charges brought against you. Know that, on the present thirteenth day of the month of October, you are deposed from the episcopate by the holy and ecumenical council, and deprived of all ecclesiastical rank. End quote. The decision to depose him was primarily due to his refusal of the triple summons is a reference to Canon 74 of the Apostolic Canons. Furthermore, Canon 30 of Chalcedon allows for the Egyptian synod to elect a new patriarch prior to their voting on the decrees of Chalcedon. This was done immediately, and St. Proterius was elected, and he, leading the Egyptian synod, signed the decrees of Chalcedon along with his bishops. Likewise, Anatolius of Constantinople, Maximus II of Antioch, and Juvenal of Jerusalem, as well as numerous representatives from their synods, signed the decrees at the council itself, their names being repeatedly given in the lists of signatories. What Michael Lofton is referring to, though, is the rise of the so-called monophysite churches, those being the Copts, Ethiopians, and Eritreans, Syriacs, Malankaran, and Armenians. Now, had entire churches in existence, or even a majority of the synods rejected Chalcedon, Lofton would have a point. But, as we discussed in the first video, that is not at all the case. Rather, in the cases of both the Copts, who administered not only Egypt but also Ethiopia and modern-day Eritrea, as well as the Syriacs, who came to administer churches scattered population in the Levant, Mesopotamia, Persia, and India, their hierarchy takes its root largely in Jacob Baradeus, who went on an ordination spree, creating thousands of bishops, priests, and deacons in an effort to create a new, a parallel monophysite hierarchy in the 6th century. In other words, these were not acts of legitimate synods, but of almost random breakaway members who went on ordination sprees to create new synods, specifically in order to reject Chalcedon. The situation is analogous to the so-called true orthodox movement in existence today. Random members of synods breaking away and consecrating their own new synod. In the case of the Armenian church, it was never entirely autocephalous, but rather dependent upon the see of Caesarea. Due to Persian invasions, it became de facto autocephalous, but never by decree, 
which is why, to this day, its head leader is not a patriarch, but a Catholicos. Ironically, despite having two Catholicoi, the modern Armenian church also has two patriarchs, each of which is subordinate to a Catholicos. Even though there were Armenian bishops present at Chalcedon, the Armenian church accepted the Henotikon at the First Council of Dvin in 506, but first officially rejected Chalcedon by name at the Second Council of Dvin in 554. Despite this, in 573, the Armenian Catholicos John II accepted Chalcedon. Several years later, a third Catholicosate within the Armenian church was established in the Georgian-speaking city of Mitzketa, and in 590, Kirion, the secretary to the monophysite Catholicos Moses II of Armenia, was elected to be Catholicos of Mitzketa. This now provided the Armenian church with three Catholicosets, Echma Edzin, Albania of the Caucasus, comprising parts of modern-day Azerbaijan and Dagestan, and Mitzketa. In 593, a synod was called in the city of Theodosiopolis, and the majority of the Armenian bishops were present. They deposed the monophysite Catholicos Moses II and elected John Bagarantsi III, who then led them in formally accepting the Council of Chalcedon. Seven years later, in 600 to 601, Catholicos Kirion, as well as the Catholicos of Albania of the Caucasus, led their synods in formally accepting the Council of Chalcedon as well. This now meant that all three Catholicosets of the Armenian Church were simultaneously adhering to Chalcedon with their synods. In reaction, a handful of monophysite bishops who rejected Theodosiopolis and Catholicos John III gathered for the Council of Dvin III in either 607 or 609 to 610, and, depending on the date, either elected Abraham I of Agbaton as Catholicos and again rejected Chalcedon or simply rejected Chalcedon. From extant records, Armenian church councils were usually around 15 to 20 bishops, but this council was so small that we were unable to find any extant record for the bishops present, just that the monophysite Catholicos Abraham and some clergy and laity were present, driving home the fact that this was rogue members who had broken off from their legitimate synod to form a new one, just like the Syriac and Coptic synods had been formed. In 611, John Baragantzi III was taken prisoner by the Persians and died in captivity, leaving the Chalcedonian Armenian Catholicoset empty and its diocese to be ruled by the Catholicos of Mitzketa in modern day Georgia, which ruled several Armenian dioceses until the 11th century. By that time, most of the traditional Armenian sees had been absorbed into the ecumenical patriarchate. So, in short, yes, the Armenian church did accept Chalcedon, but a handful of bishops then set up a rival synod, and it is from that rival synod that the modern-day Armenian synod traces its lineage, and it is actually the Georgian Orthodox Church that is the rightful torchbearer of the now-defunct Chalcedonian Armenian Church. For details on further reading, please consult the video description below. Having addressed those clips from Mr. Lofton's video attempting to respond to us, we can proceed on to those clips from other Lofton videos in which he repeatedly strawmans and attacks the Orthodox Church and its teachings. What is important to note prior to these clips is that Michael Lofton's bread and butter is peddling what might be called Orthodox scandal porn, in which he repeatedly attempts to argue that the Orthodox Church has the same issues with liturgical abuses and leftist infiltration that the Catholic Church does. As with most of his claims against us, he does this largely by making vague assertions and providing relatively few citations for these types of claims he is making. Much of his argument boils down to saying, some random Orthodox say this, and some random Orthodox online say that, because they ain't got no magisterium, as a way to stoke the anxiety of more conservative Catholics who are beginning to look towards the Orthodox Church. One such example is a show Mr. Lofton aired entitled, What Online Orthodox Apologists Won't Tell You in which Lofton repeatedly asserts that Orthodox hierarchy is infested with Universalists, but he fails to name a single one. An entire episode going on and on about the supposed infestation of Universalists in the Orthodox hierarchy, and not one specific instance, bishop or even priest, can be brought up. This is not to say there are not a handful of random clergy who hold to this, 
but it is rather telling that neither Mr. Lofton nor David Bentley Hart, whose video Lofton is responding to, can name even one. To those who are familiar with Mr. Lofton's channel, this is no surprise. His modus operandi is typically to assert and then provide no concrete examples, followed by blanket citing anonymous sources, or, as we saw in one of the clips in the previous video, he simply tells someone to go read where, or read Florovsky, or go read this or that author, without citing the specific work he thinks they should read, let alone a page number of actual quotation. Whenever Catholic social media churns with turmoil, whether it is with the Synod on Synodality seriously considering female ordination and new ways to be inclusive of Skittles types, or Pope Francis supposedly discouraging proselytism, or the increasingly predictable and disturbing regularity of revelations about the infestation of the Catholic hierarchy with pedophiles, Michael Lofton goes on tirades about the Orthodox Church. This is entirely predictable. He is watching as conservative Catholics look east, wondering why we don't have the issues Rome has, despite lacking the infallible autocrat that they were promised would prevent division and ensure clarity. Mr. Lofton drives home this idea that the Pope brings unity in this clip from his interview on Pints with Aquinas. Get, getting back to what I was saying here, you now have to decide, okay, what, which communion are you going to join? And again, some of the Orthodox are going to say, but yeah, we've had this problem in the early church. There have been schisms taking place in the early church. Sure, that's true. But guess how these schisms were resolved? It was generally through the papacy, which they lack at this mm. point. So my concern is, how is this situation going to be fixed moving forward? Mm. Mr. Lofton makes two assertions. One, Orthodox Christians cannot solve schisms on their own. Two, schisms in the first millennium were generally solved by the papacy. His first assertion ignores that we have solved numerous schisms on our own in the second millennium without a pope. For example, in 2022, we healed the Macedonian schism, which had lasted 55 years from 1967 to 2022. In 2007, a roughly 80-year-long schism between the Moscow Patriarchate and Rokor was healed. In 1998, we healed a schism within the Bulgarian Church at a pan-Orthodox council. In 1996, we healed a three-month-long schism between the Ecumenical Patriarchate and the Moscow Patriarchate over the status of the Orthodox Church in Estonia. In 1946, we healed the schism of the Renovationist Church, comprised of the Living Church, the Union of the Communities of the Ancient Apostolic Church, and the Union of the Renewal of the Church, which began in 1922. In 1945, a 73-year-long schism between Bulgaria and the Ecumenical Patriarchate was healed. In 1560, we healed a 93-year-long schism between the Ecumenical Patriarchate and the Moscow Patriarchate concerning who the rightful Metropolitan of Kiev and all the Rus was. To Michael Lofton's second claim that schisms in the first millennium were solved, quote, generally by the papacy, end quote, that is not only inaccurate, but patently false. Schisms in the first millennium were usually solved by the emperor or local councils, or the group simply atrophying away, such as its leadership dying off, at which point people start to trickle back to the church, and the last hierarch dies, thereby ending the sect. In reality, the papacy tended to create and or exacerbate existing schisms. For example, 1. Miletian Schism. From 360 to 418 in Antioch, St. Miletius became bishop of Antioch in 360. In 361, Roman Alexandria backed Paulinus as the rightful bishop of Antioch, while the three Cappadocians and most of Syria backed St. Miletius. St. Miletius presided over Constantinople I in 381 AD, reposing during the council, having never resumed communion with Rome, but professing the same faith. As Patriarch of Constantinople, St. John Chrysostom, who had been ordained by St. Miletius, played a pivotal role in resolving the schism by convincing Pope Syracius to side with St. Miletius' successor, Flavian, in 398. But the Eustathian party that had supported Paulinus held out until 418 when they accepted a successor in the line of Miletius named Alexander under imperial pressure. 
we can see here that Rome actually exacerbated the situation by supporting this new party. And it was St. Basil the Great, St. John Chrysostom, Miletius' successor Alexander, and imperial pressure that healed the schism. 2. Schism after the Council of Ephesus in 431. Rome, Constantinople, and Alexandria on the one hand, and Antioch on the other, were in schism for two years, from 431 to 433, and was solved by the mediation of Bishop Acacius of Beroia, who was in communion with both sides, and imperial pressure. 3. Schism of the Three Chapters The Council of Constantinople II was called to bring back moderate monophysites through the condemnation of the three chapters. It was called, run, and closed against the will of Pope Vigilius, who was actually suspended from office by the council in the seventh session. Pope Vigilius was under house arrest during most of it, and by house arrest, we mean he did not have as many servants as he usually did, so he was effectively arrested in luxury, so to say. The schism ended when the Pope submitted to the decision of the Council and retracted his first decree condemning any condemnation of the three chapters, and the East restored him to the diptycha. 4. Quattrodeciman Schism They celebrated Easter on the 14th of Nisan, regardless of the day of the week, and were popular in Asia Minor and the Levant. St. Polycarp of Smyrna, St. Tharsis of Eumenia, and St. Melito of Sardis were all noted practitioners of the movement. St. Polycarp of Smyrna and Pope St. Anicetus in the mid-2nd century had met to resolve it, but left agreeing to disagree, thereby allowing the tradition to remain. This changed when Pope St. Victor issued an excommunication of the group over the issue, but the excommunication appears to have largely been ignored outside of the city of Rome. The issue was dropped until the First Council of Nicaea decreed against it. As late as the early 5th century, there is a record of their adherence in Constantinople, though it was again condemned at the Synod of Whitby in 663 or 664 due to the practice of the Celtic Church, which was an adjusted form of quattrodeciminism. For more information on Pope St. Victor and his excommunication of the quattrodecimans, we encourage you to view our video, Orthodox Christianity versus Catholicism, Rebuttal to Eric Ibarra, on Matt Frad's Pints with Aquinas. 5. Novationist Schism Began in 251 and lasted into the 8th century, Novationism began as a movement in the city of Rome when a priest called Novation broke from Pope Cornelius due to Cornelius' supposed laxity in readmitting those who had apostatized during persecution. Novationists believed that the Church could not forgive the three capital sins of murder, adultery, and apostasy. The sinner's forgiveness had to be reserved to God in the afterlife. They spread quickly throughout the empire, possessing bishops in all of the major cities, but were slowly reabsorbed into the church as exemplified in Canon 8 of Nicaea 1, to the point that by the 8th century they had atrophied to extinction. There is no indication the papacy played any major role in solving the schism of Novation, certainly not any more than any other church. 6. Donatist Schism From 311 to the 7th century, perhaps as late as the 8th century, based in North Africa, the Donatists rejected any clergy who handed over sacred books and vessels to avoid persecution. Condemned by Rome in 313 and by the Council of Arles in 314, imperial pressure on them consisted of inconsistent repression, and both St. Augustine of Hippo and St. Optatus of Milivis wrote against them extensively, with the well-attended Conference of Carthage in 411 being dedicated to their eradication. The sect began to wane in the early 5th century and disappeared after the Islamic conquest of North Africa in the 7th century. As in the case of Novationism, there is no evidence the papacy played any role in solving this. Now, some would take issue with including the Donatists as a schism, and not as a heresy. But if the Novationists, who denied a tenet as central as the Church's ability to forgive sins, can be labeled as merely a schism, there is little reason to refuse the same title to the Donatists. 7. Schism of Miletius of Lycopolis From 305 to the 5th century, 
Aletius of Lycopolis and his followers held similar ideas to Novatian in that they refused to readmit those who had lapsed under persecution. The situation is mentioned in the synodal letter sent out from the Council of Nicaea. Like the Novatianists, it simply atrophied away. 8. Schism after the banishment of St. John Chrysostom From 404 to 407, adherents of St. John Chrysostom in the East and Pope St. Innocent refused communion with St. Atticus of Constantinople, Theophilus of Alexandria, and Porphyry of Antioch, after their role in the deposition of St. John Chrysostom at the Synod of Oak. The schism was resolved when St. John Chrysostom died, and the populace of Constantinople rioted until the saint's name was re-entered into the diptychs. As you can see, it was the rioting of the citizenry that caused St. John's name to re-enter the diptycha, not a papal intervention. But of all the schisms we have mentioned so far, this one comes closest to fitting the description of being solved by the papacy. But let us assume it was solved entirely by the papacy. This would give the Church of Rome a meager 1 in 8 record, or roughly 12.5% success rate in solving schisms. 9. Acacian Schism From 484 AD to 519 for Constantinople, and even longer for Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem, it began when Blessed Acacius of Constantinople accepted the Henotikon of Zeno, and Pope Felix III broke communion with him. Acacius responded by excommunicating Pope Felix. The schism was finally resolved by imperial fiat as Emperor Justin I and his nephew, the Emperor St. Justinian, harassed and persecuted the East into re-establishing communion with Rome. Only in the case of Constantinople was the Libellus of Hormista signed. The other sees wrote their own libelli. On the topic of the Ocasian Schism and the Libellus of Hermistus, we encourage you to see our article on the topic, The Libellus of Hermistus and the Failure of Policy. 10. Schism of the Three Chapters From 553 AD to 698, most of northern Italy broke communion with Rome over the decision of the Fifth Ecumenical Council, that being Constantinople II. Though various cities slowly came back into communion with Rome, the main city, Aquileia, which gave its name to the schism, did not do so until the Lombard king, Cunipert, called the Council of Pavia as his people had been converting from Arianism to Nicene Christianity. The schism would have lasted indefinitely had the Lombard king not put excessive pressure on the Patriarch of Aquileia to re-establish communion with Rome. 11. Schism of Maurus of Ravenna Maurus of Ravenna, who died in 671 AD, consistently petitioned the Emperor Constance for Ravenna's autocephaly from Rome until it was granted in 666. Pope St. Vitalian excommunicated him, and the schism lasted until either 682 or 683 when the Emperor Constance IV revoked Ravenna's autocephaly, thereby forcing the schism to an end. In none of these did the papacy play the key role in healing the schisms that Mr. Lofton alleges it did. In fact, the papacy has not healed their schism with the SSPX, or, for that matter, the multitude of set of a contest groups. As far as we are aware, any gains in that department have been on the basis of individuals coming over on their own, not entire groups, nor even large bodies. Nor has the papacy healed its schism with us, the Orthodox Christians, nor with the Oriental Communion, nor with the Nestorians. Furthermore, it was under the papacy's watch that the Protestant Reformation occurred. Even in the case of Gallicanism, the papacy was forced to rely upon Napoleon Bonaparte to make real progress against Gallicanism. Even to this day, the Catholic Church in Canada is heavily influenced by Gallicanism and even issued the Winnipeg Statement. In the following clip, from the show entitled Head of the Orthodox Drops a Bomb, from minute marks 719 through 927, Michael Lofton, seemingly genuinely, misinterprets what the ecumenical patriarch is saying, and does so to fit his own Catholic narrative. Here ends the first half. If you would like to listen to the second half of the video, please visit us on our Patreon page found in the links below. And special thanks to our current Patreon subscribers, whose generosity has allowed us to create more material like this and at more regular intervals.